All right. So what's something I, I asked this almost the same question back way, way back when before break. When, when is that second assumption that molecules are not going to interact? When is that a bad assumption? You have large gas molecules. That's a, that's especially going to affect the volume one, right? But the the pressure correction a plus n over v squared. Oh, I should also say somebody else asked about why why our version of the Van der Waals equation didn't look like the version. If you Google if you Google Van der Waals equation, you get a one that looks like um, n squared a over v squared. It's the same equation, right? They just distributed the squared and then and rearranged it. So if you get a different version of this, um, the only one you really have to be careful is there's a few versions where, uh, a few textbooks where A is, where this is a negative and A is usually negative as well. So you, you do have to watch the sign on some of those, but for the most part, this is the most common version. All right. so. What's going on where this, where the interaction assumption is breaking down? When is this term going to be big? When number of moles is big, when volume is small, or what's the only other term in here? A, it's not area. This is that measured value. Right? This is different for every gas. Every gas has its own, it's what we call an empirical value. Empirical just means it's measured. It doesn't come from theory. It comes from just a measurement in a lab. So that doesn't really change depending on what the gas is. This idea that you have to have them bump into each other for them to interact, right? What might change A? the type of gas molecule. I just said you had to look it up depending on what the gas molecule was, right? What might make A big? What about a gas molecule? Mass. Mass, potentially. How much they interact, which is kind of just another way of, of restating my question. What's gonna determine if they interact a lot or if they have attractive interactions? Polarity, that's where I was going. Yeah, polar molecules are going to have a lot of interactions because what's true about a polar molecule? We're going in circles with that. They attract electrons, kind of. They're attracted to each other. They're, they have a partial positive and a partial negative side, right? So half of the molecule attracts other electrons. The other half is repulsive to electrons, right? But that means if you have a molecule like water that has a partial positive side and a partial negative side, you can have a lot of interactions as long as your partial negative from one water molecule is pointed towards the partial positive of another water molecule, they're going to be attracted to each other, right? So that's an example of what we call intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces is exactly what it sounds like if you know if you know your greek roots inter means between right or across so intermolecular forces are forces between separate molecules intramolecular forces are forces within a molecule right so what's an example of an intramolecular force chemical bonds yeah chemical bonds are the single most important intramolecular force. They're what make a molecule a molecule. Intermolecular forces are what happens when you have, a, and they're pretty much, they're mostly attractive forces because things will naturally arrange themselves to be attractive forces. So we usually think of intermolecular forces as being attractive. And in general, they're not as strong as covalent bonds or ionic bonds. Ionic bonds and covalent bonds are, for the most part, stronger. All right, so 
And that intramolecular or intermolecular forces are what are responsible for phase change. The only reason that water exists as a liquid at room temperature is because at room temperature, the attractive forces between the water molecules are stronger, are strong enough to keep the water molecules from just randomly flying apart. If you give more and more kinetic energy to those water molecules, by doing what? How would you give more kinetic energy to water molecules? Heat it up. So if you heat up water, what happens? It boils eventually, right? You go through a phase change where now all of a sudden the average water molecule has enough energy that it can break free from the rest of the water molecules around it. So you reach a point where the attractive forces holding it as a liquid or a solid are not as not strong enough to keep them from flying off in random directions. Right? And so these being tiny little spheres, this lends itself to just thinking about them like ping pong balls. If you have a if I took a hundred ping pong balls and I put them in a moving box, you know, two feet by two feet by two feet put a hundred ping pong balls in the bottom and I just set it down. What are those ping pong balls going to do at the bottom? They're going to be sitting there, right? Do they still have some kinetic energy? A little bit, there might be a little bit of movement, but for the most part, they're going to stay there. They're acting as a solid. If I heat it up by taking that moving box and I'm start moving it like this, are any of them, are they still going to just be sitting at the bottom? Maybe at first, but if I start shaking faster, they're going to start moving around a little bit, right? They're still mostly going to be at the bottom of the box. They're just sort of flowing. So that's going a solid going to a liquid. If I take that box and I start shaking it like this, what's going to happen to the ping pong balls? They're just going to start flying everywhere. What happened is we added enough energy, enough kinetic energy by my, me shaking it, that they could get over the activation energy. They could break all of the, the intermolecular forces. Think of those as the walls of the box. You give it enough energy that those balls can make it over the wall of the box. Now, all of a sudden, we have free ping pong balls everywhere, right? That's like a gas. So those, I know we've talked about phases a little bit before, but that's, at its core, what's going on, it's just a matter of how strong are those intermolecular forces that determine where everything's different phase transitions are. I should probably preface, everybody know, is aware that every substance can exist in all three phases, right? Okay. All right, so how do we, characterize how strong these intermolecular forces are so that we could practice or so we could predict ahead of time what's going to have higher boiling points or lower boiling points. Well, the different type of intermolecular forces are what are going to, going to allow us to do that. Right, so the strongest type of intermolecular force I guess I'll start with the, the most common one. So here's, here's a schematic drawing of what I was showing with the water molecule with the partial positive negatives. If you have a bunch of partial positives and negatives, you're going to have attractive forces, which are drawn in red, and repulsive forces, which are drawn in blue. And your liquid or your substance is naturally going to sort of arrange itself so that all of your partial positives are next to partial negatives. And so this type of intermolecular force is called a dipole-dipole interaction. So dipole is exactly what it sounds like. It's what makes something polar. A polar molecule is by definition a dipole. Dipole just means it has a partial positive side and a partial negative side. Di meaning two poles. It has a plus and a minus. So dipole-dipole attractions. are the simplest to understand. How could we 
interactions. How could we predict if something is going to be a stronger interaction? Or what's something we could think about that might be a stronger, Parker? Strength of the polarity. How big are those partial positives and partial negatives? If you get a big enough partial positive and partial negative, it's a really attractive force. But if it's just barely polar, then it's not gonna, it's still an attractive force. There's still dipole dipole interactions, but they're not as strong. Right. And so that actually goes to this, the next strongest form, which is called a hydrogen bond. So a hydrogen bond is just a specific type of dipole dipole interaction. So where you specifically have hydrogen in a covalent bond with one of the four most electronegative elements. Does anybody remember what those are? Oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine, chlorine, not carbon. Remember, fluorine is the most electronegative, and so the closest you get to fluorine, closer you get to fluorine is more electronegative. So <laughs> nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine. Anytime you have a hydrogen attached to one of those, so nitrogen, oxygen, Chlorine, chlorine. Sulfur. Sulfur is not typically counted in there. Sulfur is only about as electronegative as carbon. So it's just these four, really. Is, is there a value for electronegativity on there? Yeah. What does it say for sulfur? Is two point six. Carbon is two point. Also two point six. Yeah. So it's really just these four. If you have a hydrogen in a covalent bond with one of these. You get a polar bond, right? And not only is it a polar bond, it's a specific, it's a very specific type of polar bond because what's true about hydrogen when it comes to how many bonds it can make? And why is that? It only has one pair of electrons in its valence, right? Even when it's when it's got a full valence, it only has one pair of electrons. If you take that one pair of electrons, chlorine on the other hand also only generally makes one covalent bond, but it has a whole bunch other electrons around it, and it's also got its its n equals two electrons and its n equals one electrons, right? Hydrogen doesn't have that. It doesn't have any electrons underneath its valence either. If you take the only two electrons that hydrogen have and you force them to be stuck in a bond between a really electronegative element, the hydrogen really doesn't have really any electrons around the nucleus, right? So because hydrogen only has two electrons in, with a full valence and it has no core electrons underneath the valence, you get a really, really strong partial positive here. Like, not quite a full plus one charge, but close to it. And so you get especially strong dipole-dipole interactions when it's hydrogen attached to one of those four most electronegative elements. So this is why water is, takes so much energy to boil, to change its temperature, um, is because oxygen is a big bully when it comes to electrons, right? Hydrogen is really, really weak, but it still, it doesn't have any other core electrons. And so you get really, really strong dipole-dipole interactions that are specifically called hydrogen bonds. Has anybody heard that term in a biology class? Yeah, it kind of, in a biology class, it typically gets kind of glossed over. Just hydrogen bonds are really important and really strong, right? That's about the level that, that you approach it sometimes in a biology class. It's one of the reasons that water is so significant and so important in biological systems is because it makes these hydrogen bonds. And it makes these hydrogen bonds because of difference in, in electronegativity and the quantum mechanics of it. The fact that hydrogen doesn't have any core electrons that can kind of keep its nucleus protected. You get almost a, a complete nucleus just sort of exposed 
because you're pulling all of the covers this way. All of the electrons are being pulled away from it. Right, so hydrogen bonds are more are stronger than your average dipole dipole interactions. What could what could we do to make an even stronger intermolecular force? Why carbon? Yeah, but carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen, so it, it's stronger, and it still has its its n equals one electrons that it that are all that belong entirely to it. So carbon actually doesn't make very polar bonds. What's that? Symmetry. Symmetry, whenever you're not sure what's going on, symmetry is a good guess. Um, if you just say either symmetry or electrons, they're not right for 99% of questions in chemistry. Um, maybe more than 99% if you go to an OCHEM class. Um, we got really strong intermolecular forces because this was a really strong partial positive, right? Almost a plus one. What if it was a plus one? What, it, what happens when you dissolve salt in water? You get what? Salt, you get sodium ions floating around and chloride ions floating around, right? If we had if we had an attractive force between a partial negative on the oxygen and a full positive on sodium, is that going to be stronger or weaker than an oxygen than a water molecule next to another water molecule? Yeah, this is almost a plus one. That is a plus one, right? So positives are attracted to negatives, the bigger value, stronger the value is, the more they're attracted to each other, right? So the strongest type of intermolecular force is actually an ion dipole interaction. An ion dipole interaction can be almost as strong as an ionic bond. If ionic bonds are stronger than ion dipole bonds, then why does salt dissolve in water in the first place? So if you had it as Na plus attracted to Cl minus, that should be an even stronger force, right? What is it about the water that allows it to break that. If, even if that's if that's an even stronger force, how come this happens? We know salt dissolves in water because there's more of them. Because you can take every sodium ion and surround it with six water molecules in an octahedral shape, as opposed to a sodium being kind of surrounded by chlorides, but it doesn't get quite as many interactions. You can take every single sodium ion and surround it with six waters. All right, so we can want ionic bonds are stronger than ion dipole bonds, but there's a sliding scale there, which is why some ionic compounds dissolve and some don't. If the ion ion bond attraction is too strong, it doesn't dissolve which is why if you've got something with a plus two charge and a minus three charge, it's probably not gonna dissolve in water. But if you have a bunch of plus ones and minus ones, six water or six ion dipole attractions is probably enough to overcome that. You do get to a point where it won't dissolve anymore, right? What happens when you reach the saturation point, when you reach equilibrium, with something like salt dissolving in water is basically, think about what that reaction looks looks like. We had NaCl solid 
forming Na plus aqueous and Cl minus aqueous. If you let this system get to equilibrium, what that's saying is that these two are running into each other and sticking back together at the same rate as the solid is dissolving. So basically, if you have enough of these, you, base, you get to the point where they're going to randomly run into each other and stick just because you found something even better than a water molecule, right? If there's enough of them. But this is still an equilibrium reaction. Getting to that saturation point is an equilibrium reaction. Um, there are a lot of other things that go into this as well, like entropy that winds up affecting this. And whether it's an endothermic or an exothermic reaction winds up inter interacting with this. Because if I tell you, let's think, think about Le Chatelier's principle. If I tell you that this is a endothermic reaction, because it is. So you have to put heat into it for this to happen. What happens if you heat, if you're at equilibrium and then you heat up the solution? which is another way of saying you can dissolve more salt in hot water than cold water or sugar for that matter. Has anybody ever made maple syrup? No, not around, not a big, not a big maple syruping community here. Mapling community. I don't remember what the verb is for making maple syrup. I think it's mapling. You have to boil it. You boil it all down and it only stays dissolved because you're adding all that extra heat. Otherwise, the sugar precipitates out. All right. Last type of, of attractive force. If we don't have a dipole, If we have a totally nonpolar molecule, say nitrogen, that's a totally nonpolar molecule. Does it still have attractive forces? How do we know? What happens for these, these other attractive forces were useful for thinking about things like phase change, right? Why do you go back to what I started with? when do you get a solid or a liquid forming instead of just everything staying as gas molecules? When there's attractive forces, right? And I already told you at the beginning, everything can be a liquid, right? Including nonpolar molecules. And everybody's familiar with at least the idea of liquid nitrogen, right? So how does that happen? How do we have attractive force if we don't have a dipole here? Less energy, it does have to get really cold. There's not, their attractive forces are not very strong. But it turns out everything has some amount of attractive forces, right? And so any, I guess I should say anything that has electrons has some attractive forces, right? And so these are what are called dispersion forces. Basically, if you think of a helium atom, you've got a plus two in the middle, and you've got two electrons around the outside, right? Totally nonpolar. There is a chance at any given moment, if you measured where those electrons were, they'd be more on one side of the nucleus than the other. On average, they're going to be evenly spread around the nucleus. But if we measured at any given moment, there's a chance that both electrons are on the same side of the nucleus. If both electrons are on the same side of the nucleus, that means we get a dipole for just a second. Well, it's a momentary dipole or an induced dipole. <laughs> this momentary dipole is still enough that it can cause an attraction with things around it. And because if you have a neutral helium atom next to one of these induced dipoles, momentary dipoles, it makes all the helium or atoms around it temporarily look like that because the helium atom on either side is going to arrange itself the same way. It's going to mi mimic that 
so that it, its electrons are being pulled towards the temporary positive, which means its electrons are going away from the temporary negative. Right? And so we wind up with anything that has electrons has some amount of attractive force. So these, they're, the full name is London Dispersion Forces, or LDF. These are the weakest intermolecular forces. But if you have electrons, they're also there, which means even nonpolar molecules can go through a phase change. And the more electrons you have, the more London dispersion forces you have. <laughs> Which means, how do you get more electrons in a, in a molecule? Have a bigger molecule. We have a whole bunch of carbons in a row. Think about natural gas. Natural gas is methane, which is CH4. Octane, which is C8H. I can't do that right now. 18 is a liquid because it has, they're both nonpolar, but the bigger molecule has more of these dispersion forces. We'll do some practice with that and in talking about more intermolecular forces and phase change on either Wednesday or Friday.